All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. So I'm Linda Durhak. Welcome to this University of Illinois Extension Local Government Education Webinar. Today we will be discussing funding opportunities for energy and the environment available to Illinois communities at the state and federal levels. This webinar is co-sponsored by Prairie Rivers Network and the Great Lakes Thriving Community Technical Assistance Center with funding from the US EPA and Department of Energy. We have three speakers. Each will present and then we will take questions at the end of the presentations. If you have a question, please put it in the chat and we will share questions with the speakers during the Q&A at the end. Depending on the question, speakers may answer in the chat as well. Um, as you see, we are recording this webinar. You will get a link to the recording and contact information for the speakers in the next few days. You can always find local government education webinars on our YouTube channel. So before we get started here, I just want to give an introduction to the Great Lakes Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Center. So we refer to this as the Great Lakes Tic Tac. This center is designed to get state and federal funds in the hands of local communities to plan for and implement environmental infrastructure and energy transition projects. It is headquartered at the University of Minnesota and includes several other states that you can see in this map. Illinois Extension and Prairie Rivers have partnered to support Illinois communities. So here's just an idea of some of the resources we offer and assistance we have. So we are here to help identify funding opportunities, do research to learn about what other communities have done and what might work for your community. If your community is rural, remote, or underserved, we can help you with planning and putting together a grant application. We can also connect you to people who can help you from the beginning to the end. So here is the website for the Tic Tac if you're interested in signing up for the newsletter or filling out an intake form for technical assistance. We also do have a website for the Illinois office specifically, so I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. So if any of these funding opportunities seem interesting to you, you can always reach out for technical assistance to learn more. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, and then it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Roxanne Anderson. She is the regional director for the EPA Region 5 Kansas State University Technical Assistance to Brownfields Center, and she will share information about Brownfields funding opportunities. Thank you. Let me see if I can get this up. Okay. Sorry, I just had a hiccup. <laughs> All right, can everybody see? Looks great. Yes. Thank you, sorry. Um, all right, so my name is Roxanne Anderson. As she mentioned, I'm the um, director for US EPA Region 5's KSU TAB program, so technical assistance to brownfields. And um, for those of you who don't know, I'm just gonna briefly go over what a brownfield is, but it's a very broad topic that touches on a lot of different things, including um, a lot of things that involve environmental justice, um, climate change and the energy field. And so just a brief introduction as to what is a brownfield. Um, as I said, is very uh, broad topic, but it's essentially a property um, that either has the perception of being contaminated or is contaminated. So because it follows that largest definition, um, it can really be almost anything because you don't actually know yet if it is contaminated. Um, but those contaminations can include anything from um, hazardous substances like petroleum or um, lead paint, what you would think of, up to asbestos that might be in just an old building or an uh, old gas station. Um, Here's a list of things that uh, fall under the brownfield topic. A lot of these you might expect, and a lot of them in your community you would not maybe expect to be a um, brownfield, such as a marina or um, a shooting range or something like that. So almost every community has a brownfield or multiple, um, and a lot of them are underdeveloped because it's a very big challenge to get them cleaned up. So... In the brownfield world, there's usually a general range um, of tasks that need to happen in order to go through that process. The 
planning process usually always comes first. Sometimes it doesn't, but it's always best if it does. Um, and we are here to help with that. Um, you usually need to go through some level of assessments to assess the property, get it cleaned up, and then get it ready for reuse. And during those um, four tasks, there's funding that's available to help you with that. Um, a lot of times there are free services out there, a lot of that, uh, which I'm going to talk about today. There are also a lot of grants, which I will talk about, um, as well as some loans with very low interest rates for communities that have the capacity. So generally when you are going through the process of determining is this property in my community a brownfield, um, you need to get it assessed. There's two different types of environmental assessments that usually happen in this process. The first is a phase one assessment. This is just the paper type of assessment where they go through and they look at all the historical records over the last few hundred years. They look at Sanborn maps, any potential reuse slash owner of the property. Um, they do interviews, they do um, a slight inventory. And so this is really helpful when trying to determine, does this have a potential? So if they identify something, it's called a REC, a recognized environmental condition, um, then that is when they move on to a phase two. The phase two actually does the sampling. So there's no sampling or anything that takes place during phase one. The phase two was when they they test the media. So whether that is soil samples, um, groundwater samples, vapor air intrusion samples, anything like that to kind of get a scope of what is the level of contamination. And from there, you can kind of move forward with creating a remedial plan in how to clean it up. Um, asbestos surveys are also on that list. They can also do lead paint surveys. So if it is, um, for example, if you have like a very large um, apartment building that has been um, empty for a while or an old school building in your community that has a lot of asbestos or lead paint, um, that is considered a brownfield and you can get surveys and remediation estimates for that. So what is KSU TAP? So TAB <clears throat> is um, originally funded from the US EPA. It is a technical assistance program and it's designed to help the redevelopment um, and assessment of um, brownfields to help them move forward in the process because they've become kind of stagnant. And this started about 25 years ago. KSU TAB has been a longstanding technical assistance program and we cover four of the US um, EPA regions, five, six, seven, and eight. We are also um, the national TAB. So we cover any national projects or programs throughout the entire country that covers all 10 regions. Um, and I have listed here the um, entities that also hold the other regions if you're located in another region. Um, and we can always also just connect you to those um, technical assistance communities that can help you if that is the case. Um, but all of our services are free since they are federally grant funded. We do everything in the brownfield world from the beginning of a project to the end of a project. Anything that you can think of that might be attached to um, a brownfield in your community, we can probably assist with. So we can help on the front end with um, capacity building. If you're not sure if you can handle a grant, we can have those conversations. If you want to apply for a grant, we can have those conversations. Um, we can help you identify. We can help you create an inventory. We can help you create a vision plan for your community. Um, we can help you with site reuse for a project. Um, we can help build community resiliency. Uh, we do lots of web webinars and workshops um, for both state size or small community or rural communities. Um, we can help with dealing with the really overwhelming things um, for small communities, such as contractor procurement, um, help you identify just resources. Where can you start? What are my resources for this project? It's a very wide range. So if when in doubt and you have a question about a brownfield, you can just come to us and we can tell you, hey, this is what we can help you with. These are your options. Because a lot of times we're also willing to work on something that we might not have done in the past. And so um, as long as it falls into the realm, uh, we're open to it. So here's another list um, and a few more examples. We do a lot of reviews of plans. So if you were to get a phase one and have no idea what this means, I've never read one of these before, we can help you with that. Um, same goes with a phase two. Um, we do fact sheets for communities to kind of help with that. We can do surveys to kind of gather information if you were trying to figure out um, what your community wants or needs. So just a few quick examples of this. Um, we did, we've done a lot, 
a lot of visioning projects is one of my favorite um, to do. This was a community engagement and downtown visioning project we did for um, two specific sites in a community. And we did um, a really fun outreach, a community engagement workshop. And we did a um, survey that was left open for about two months. And they're in the process now of um, putting together their site reuse plan and visioning based on um, what their community really wanted. And um, they're, develop they're working with a developer in process for that now. Another project um, is with a larger entity. It's with... Um, <clears throat> an alliance and they are working, you know, over a larger scope and we are working with them to create a plan that encompasses all three areas um, to kind of help them with a district. So we're kind of focusing on a vision plan for um, their whole corridor that kind of ties them all together that includes multiple brownfields and it includes a little bit of the economic development side. They're doing a brownfield inventory um, they're doing some redevelopment opportunity analysis. We've got a resource roadmap and a story map so that the communities can go online and kind of look at what projects are being worked on and what stake, um, what state they're in. Um, so there's a lot of fun things going on with that project. And again, we did um, an in-person workshop as well as um, a few online surveys for them. And this is kind of where <laughs> that corridor looks now and they mapped out for them. Um, this is also still in process and what they're wanting to do with this type of plan, but this is just an example, depending on the capacity that your community is in and where you wanna go. Um, so a few resources and how we can help with this um, are all online. Um, we generally have 40, about 40 partners that we work with. So our, our bench is very deep. So KSU TAB has quite a bit of knowledge just within our own staff, but then we also have a large range of resources and partners and consultants and contractors that we work with to make any project really work. Um, we do, we have a uh, Brownfield Community Capacity Assessment Tool that is fairly new that kind of help communities go through and say, hey, what capacity does our community have slash need to work on these brownfield projects. We also have an excellent array of e-suite tools, um, which I might go through another one in a minute, but we have a bit tool that helps communities create their own inventory and we can train you on how to do that. We have a, a tool that helps you write your grants to make sure that you don't miss anything while you're kind of going through that and walks you through that process. Um, so there's a, a wide range of tools that are available and one of the partners that I want to highlight that I kind of just talked about is um, RMI, which is a Rocky Mountain Institute. We partner with them um, quite a bit and they uh, all across um, the U.S. and they partner with the other um, tab providers as well. And we work with them um, mostly with communities and specific site owners um, about brownfield reuse options that include clean energy, mostly solar fields. So we work a lot with um you know, um, landfills are very popular, but we also work within communities and cities, um, just focusing mostly on bright fields. So this is a really good option. And if you're interested in this or think you might be interested in this, we can always have a conversation with RMI and they help you go through that technical assistance aspect in determining, is this good? What questions do I need answered? Is this a fit? Um, and if it is, they will continue to help you through that project. So they're a really great partner for that. And this is um, an example of the Tabby Z online grant writing tool that I mentioned um, that is a really great option for going through US EPA grants for brownfields. And I'm just going to briefly go through some of those grants. Um, most of the information on these slides is really just for you to like look back on for the future just because there's so many of them. I just kind of want you to know how much is available um, at your fingertips. So this year, the grant season closes November 14th, so it's already coming up to a close. Um, but we have community-wide grants for US EPA Brownfield grants, coalition grants, and cleanup grants. Um, and being offered in total is over $217 um, million. So there's a lot of money going out um, the door and a lot of things that are um, possible for smaller communities now, especially since... This year, there's no match. I'm not sure if that's going to be the case next year, but um, it's been a really great opportunity for a lot of uh, programs. 
community-wide assessment grants um, generally can cover a lot of the th similar things that KSU tab can help with, but not actually do, such as your actual phase one and phase two. Um, but they also do site-specific remediation plans to get you ready for cleanup, which we could help with, develop inventory of sites, um, plan for redevelopment, et cetera. So it covers a broad scope of items. Um, and the coalition grant is very similar. There's just a little bit more money and you usually work with other communities. That's designed to help communities that don't really have the capacity to hold a US EPA grant on their own. And it's also available to um, their state and tribal grants available up to 2 million. Cleanup grants are also really popular because it's very difficult to actually get the brownfield clean. Um, and with no match, it's a really excellent option. And there are multiple awards from anywhere from 500,000 to 4 million. Um, the trick with a cleanup grant is that um, there's a little bit more preparation and work. You might want to have a conversation with someone if you're thinking about applying for that. Um, and you do have to own the property and not be a cause or contributor to the um, uh, issue that caused the clean that needs the cleanup essentially the um, timeline is also a little bit longer than some other things so it really just depends on that as well like I said the um, application is due on the 14th and the money is not usually released until the following year if you're awarded and I just want to briefly go over the Illinois Brownfield program I'm not an expert in this but I do want to let you know that you do have state funds that are funded from the US EPA as well to help with brownfields um, Jacob Fink is um, you're going to be your main contact his contact information is at the end really quick at the end and um, he is going to be the one that's going to be able to help you with that but in general Illinois um, TBA program targeted brownfield assessment program is really great it doesn't cost anything um, you just have to do an application. Um, they have a lot of services that they can provide for free, and they usually handle the contractors um, to do that. So you can, it's really helpful for those communities that have a low capacity. Um, you do have to be a municipality or a government um, or quasi-government entity. Um, the link on here is available to get to that application. It's fairly Simple. You just have to know about the property, but you do not have to um, own it. You just have to have access to it. So a lot of times communities will uh, um, apply on behalf of like an, a private owner because they are going to push that towards redevelopment that's going to benefit the community as a whole. They also have um, their remediation program where you can voluntarily clean up. Um, your site and release you from liability on that site. They have technical assistance that's free for that. Um, although the program for cleaning up does um, have a fee for that, but then they also have a 0% um, loan rate um, for a revolving loan fund if you have a larger project and you have a little bit more capacity. Um, so they have a lot of range of options for funding as well to help you um, through your project. This is the contact information. Um, like I mentioned, Jacob Fink is going to be your main uh, TBA person, but then I also have the contact information on here if you are looking um, to do a cleanup. And then um, this is my contact information. So I will, with that, I will pass it off. If you have any questions, I can be here um, and, or you can just shoot me an email. Um, I'm always available. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roxanne. I really appreciate that overview. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker, which is Monica Badali. She is the Senior Program Manager of the Renewable Energy Team at the Great Lanes Institute, which is also a partner of the Great Lakes Tic Tac. And she's going to share information about the Energy in Remote and Rural Areas Grant Program. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, give me a second to share my presentation. I hope everyone can see this okay. That looks great. <clears throat> All right, so um, I work for the Great Plains Institute and as Linda mentioned, um, also a member of the Great Lakes Tic Tac uh, here in Minneapolis. We uh, could be one of the people who would be helping for people, uh, for anybody, communities who are willing uh, and wanting to apply for this new grant that just opened last week on October 3rd. Um, I will today just briefly go over some of the main um, criteria and what kinds of projects DOE is looking for in this round of uh, the ERA grants. There is actually a webinar for this exact grant 
today evening at four, I'll also share a link uh, for those who have not registered and who would like to, but the webinars are always available on the DOE's website um, once they are done and recorded. I'll also very briefly mention uh, or give a list of projects that were awarded in previous rounds um, to kind of just get an idea of um, what kinds of projects generally get um, funded in this opportunity. All right, so the uh, goal of the ERA funding is to build clean energy projects that have a huge benefit to communities uh, directly. So the uh, projects can either be um, off-grid projects, they can be on-site, off-site, but there needs to be some benefit directly linked to the community. So that's what ties the ERA funding together. Um, these are some of the goals of this project uh, to deliver measurable and sustainable benefits to people that again um, are living in rural or remote areas. Um, that is again a key and pretty much the focus as the name says um, to areas of such. Um, there are six different uh, eligible activities that have been listed for the past two rounds, uh, also continues for this particular round. It needs to be for communities that have a population of less than 10,000 people. Um, I don't want to read out all of this, but always open to uh, questions at the end. So this coming to this particular um, RFP that was released October 3rd. The concept papers are due um, on Feb 27th of the upcoming year, 25, and the applications are due August 28th. Some basic information, uh, this round, they're expecting to give up to $400 million total for all of the projects. Um, expecting to award about 20 to 50 awards. All of them need to be a cooperative agreements. Um, and depending on which area you select to apply for, there is uh, some cost share requirement, which can vary from five to 50%. I do have a quick slide on, depending on what area you wanna apply, what is that percentage requirement, just to give an idea. Um, and the duration for these projects um, is also pretty long, but it should be wrapped up in seven years from when the award has been uh, given. So there are four main topic areas, uh, the open category, dual use and co-location, small scale community centered, and then isolated microgrids uh, and un unelectrified buildings uh, category. Uh, this is kind of the project and cost share amount breakdown. There are some eligibility criteria which will qualify communities um, and uh, partners for a much lower cost share agreement than would typically be required. The eligibility criteria for that is uh, detailed in the RFP. But this is what uh, the expectation is for single, uh, um, like the minimum and max for awards. So they are really big awards that uh, can make huge change uh, in communities. Um, coming to the eligible parties, the, the Indian tribes, state and local government entities, nonprofits and for-profit organizations are all eligible as primes. But in addition to that, there are tribal organizations, the rural electric co-ops, farming associations and co-ops, labor unions, um, educational institutes, uh, incorporated consortia, and also unincorporated consortia who also can qualify as a sub recipients. Um, so it pretty much covers um, a wide eligible um, parties that can apply. The focus for this particular round is on three main things. One is the community perception. As we all know, there is uh, a lot of conflict um, and different perceptions in communities when it comes to dual use solar. Um, most commonly, 
found ones uh, or most commonly cited ones talk about community character, economic development opportunities and such. So the focus for uh, grants that want to focus on the community perception, it's encouraged that um, they include as many community members as possible in trying to make decisions for ultimate projects that will um, affect their own community. The suggestion is to use some sort of community ownership or equity models and kind of building these partnerships to have as large as a coalition as possible um, to have a better chance of uh, securing the grant. The second focus opportunity for this is on permitting and siting. There are always challenges for um, zoning since uh, PV solar installations is not something that has traditionally been done. Uh, even in urban areas, they are still, uh, still grappling with uh, how do we make these kind of land and ordinance changes. So this would be a good um, option if uh, any community feels like they are there. Um, this again would, uh, would be really nice to have communities that have really strong uh, partnerships with government agencies, um, solar developer stakeholders, and again, communities that can really inform um, how best to incorporate um, conducive permitting and siting in grants. The last focus is uh, downstream value chains. Uh, again, a huge importance on what kind of direct benefits are these communities getting from these projects. So that link, uh, the more clear you can make it, the more beneficial it is. DOE follows the adoption readiness level framework and these three are from that. There is more information um, in the RFP and there's also a link to look at the other adoption readiness uh, level framework aspects. Uh, well, it's important, I feel, to also know what projects are not going to be funded. And there are five categories that is specified in the RFP that will definitely not be funded. One is uh, the large transmission projects, um, single campus projects, uh, usually something like a rooftop solar that only benefits that specific building. But if that roof so, roof, rooftop solar is looking at doing some kind of additional battery storage that could benefit a much larger community and improve some sort of uh, resilience and integrity of uh, a microgrid, then those projects could be considered. EVs, EV charging stations for personal use, again, are not going to be funded. But if there is a larger EV charging infrastructure that can be incorporated into an existing project or can be bundled up with another project, those, again, could be considered. Uh, and projects in, uh, involving only weatherizations, whether buildings or homes, again, will not be funded. Uh, the concept paper, as I said, is due in um, Feb. This is a list of uh, things that's required. Um, the concept paper page limit is about seven. Uh, application, as you all know, much more intense, um, not due until August of next year. There is going to be a huge emphasis on community benefits planning and community benefit plan is something that's required as part of the work plan. So that's... Um, it's important to start thinking about that because uh, the more engagement you have with communities upfront, the more stronger that community benefit plan can be. Um, as I said, the uh, this is not the first round of ERA. It has been rolling on for a couple of years now. This is just a summary of uh, previous grants that were awarded and the number of winners, um, the number of states that these have been, that these projects have been awarded and just uh, the dates since when they've been rolling. Um, I have a, a few uh, slides just on talking about the projects um, and what, um, what they had proposed just to give an idea. Uh, so this is the first round of grants that was awarded. Um, this was a two phase, um, project rollout. This is a map that shows where all of the projects had been awarded. There were two separate tracks, a partner track and a finance track. Um, these are the list. I just pulled out the projects that are um, 
that fall under the EPA Region 5. There are many more projects, as you saw, the numbers were like 67 for Phase 1 and 33 for Phase 2. Um, so these are the projects that were awarded in um, Region 5. You can see there is one in uh, Illinois for the finance track and uh, a couple for the partner track. The ones that are in purple and in bold, they were also awarded an additional grant for the Phase 2 to continue the work that they've already started. These projects, a majority of them were solar installations. Um, there were also a lot of uh, projects that were focused on battery energy storage systems, upgrading substations to increase capacity, um, upgrading existing overhead electric lines, um, installing microgrid controllers, these kind of uh, um, grants. Uh, the slides will be shared and circulated to everybody. And there are links here um, on the slides that will take you to um, where you can see what all of these projects are, where they are located, and a brief summary of um, what they propose to do. Some of them have a follow-up where you can see what they are currently doing as well. Uh, this is a, a second award that was uh, given. And these are some of the projects that were awarded. The Adams Electric Co-op Green Energy Project is an Illinois project. Uh, all of these are, again, links. You can click on them, and it'll take you to where they uh, to the project websites. This particular grant opportunity of uh, $366 million, um, which was also awarded uh, early this year, mostly focused on tribal nations. These projects included things like improving microgrid reliability and resiliency with uh, PV installations along with battery storage. There were also a couple of uh, run of the river hydroelectricity facilities, um, one of which was also a new construction. There was also a project that was a off-grid solar PV installation, but that completely benefited nearby communities. Um, one other interesting project was a forest biomass to energy, energy converter. Um, again, all of these are links that will take you to the individual websites. The focus, though, for every single grant has always been on good community benefit plans, showing how many households are being benefited from this, how uh, and showing the depth and breadth of uh, different st stakeholders being brought into the process. So that's, again, um, important to focus for this as well. The um, Any questions relating to this grant can be addressed to the US Department of Energy. That's their email. And the link that I had mentioned, um, this is the link to register for a much more detailed webinar for the grant, uh, which is going to happen today, coincidentally. And that is about what I wanted to share about the grant. If there's anything in particular that you want me to talk about, um, please let me know. I'll be happy to um, share or give a little more insight. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, there will definitely be questions during the Q&A after our final speaker. So yeah. with that being said, I will introduce our third and last speaker, which is Christine Davis. She is the manager for the watershed management section of the Bureau of Water at Illinois EPA. And she's going to share information about the green infrastructure grant opportunities known as DIGO. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the um, webinar and, um, organizers for inviting us to give some information about the Illinois EPA Green Infrastructure Grant Opportunities Program. Um, it's great to get the information out because we really do want the resources to go out and help protect our rivers, lakes, and streams. So we refer to this as GIGO, the Green Infrastructure Grant Opportunities Program. And there's four main components to the GIGO program that you have to have all four of these components in order for your project to be eligible for the program. 
The first is implementation of green infrastructure best management practices. The second is that it's reducing stormwater runoff, and that can be from urban or rural areas. The third is that it's reducing localized or riverine flooding. Localized flooding could be subdivisions, it could be business areas, it could be um, a rural area that, that's experiencing difficulties. The riverine flooding would be more of your lake or your water bodies that are seeing an increased um, water flow, possibly running into erosion problems because of flashiness or the amount of water getting into the area. And then the last item is to protect a river stream or lake. So these are state of Illinois funds. This is an active notice of funding opportunity out online and applications are due November 20th of 2024. Um, Okay, so the Green Infrastructure Grant Opportunities Program, we basically had $25 million or $5 million a year for five years. The NOFO that's active now is the fourth year of funding. We will also be doing a notice of funding opportunity in the spring of 2025. So if you aren't ready for the November 20th deadline, keep working and consider applying uh, in the spring of 25. Now the GEIGO program is because we only have $5 million for the entire state of Illinois. We have limited the funding to installation of best management practices and some design costs. Basically 15% of the total eligible BMP costs not to exceed $50,000, whichever's less can be used to go for the design costs. We get that design costs are way more than $50,000 and that. But again, with not a lot of money to go throughout the state and really wanting to actually protect our rivers, lakes, and streams, we went ahead and put those caveats on there. Now, the $50,000 or the amount, the 15%, that's a combination of both the grant award dollars and the match dollars. So when you're looking at the program budget, no more than $50,000 for actual design work. The type of best management practices that are eligible and that are gonna get um, the best chance of getting funded are projects that are doing floodplain reconnections like two-stage ditch projects or daylighting projects or even levee retrofits where um, you change up the levee system so that water can be held behind a levee that was initially made to keep water out, but we can actually modify them now and with permitting, of course. Um, but look at those types of projects as well. We've got some areas where there's just so much development that's occurred that sometimes the behind the levee is the only solution that we have. Uh, porous and permeable pavement, um, parking lots, roadways, those are eligible. Bioinfiltration and retention, that can be basins, it can be trenches, it can be bioswales wetland creation or restoration. We also have an option of watershed wide projects. So it might be multiple smaller best management practices that could be a whole series of rain gardens or smaller parking areas. Um, and then we've got also the downspout and illicit inflow disconnections, which is, we're not seeing a lot of that for people supplying or applying for it, but it has been an eligible item in the past. Um, the expected applicants basically are anyone that can legally accept money from the state of Illinois. This could be municipalities, sanitary districts, park districts, watershed groups, or other not-for-profit groups that are pre-registered through the GATA portal. I'm sorry, nonprofit groups. We can even include for-profit groups in there, but again, they probably are not totally excited about us because we are so limited on where the money can go and how, how it can be spent. Now, the key on this is the GATA portal. If your organization is not yet registered in the GATA portal, you need to go into the GATA portal and GATA, sorry, Grant Accountability and Transparency Act. Um, this is a state portal and you need to go in there and get yourself registered. But before you register for the GATA portal, find out if you've got a local partner for your project that's already in the GATA portal that could be your applicant proxy for you and actually take on the responsibility of the GATA portion of the project. Because most of the not-for-profit groups that we work with and environmental groups, they really wanna spend their time fixing the environment not doing paperwork in order to be eligible for a grant program that can fix it. But municipalities, counties, townships, 
Um, most of those are already in the GATA portal. The soil and water conservation districts are in there as well. So consider talking with a partner and see if they can get there. I didn't mention that the little screen beans that are in the bottom that are mixed throughout this presentation are giving you ideas on what to think about, not only for the green infrastructure grant opportunities program, but you can use some of their hints for other applications that you're putting together as well. Uh, the program is a reimbursement program. Um, the match requirement is 25%. Uh, let's see. Okay. You don't have to have your permitting and um, design work complete at the point of application. And in fact, we've had many applications that design work was part of it. We gauge the projects on their ability to capture stormwater and hold it, and then also what the impact on flooding of riverine or localized is. So again, you've got to have those four components, but you don't have to be totally ready to go um, to get in there. Okay, um, the projects can be on public or private land. You do need confirmation in the application that all landowners are on board. If you say that there's four landowners and you say, hey, two are on board uh, and you don't mention the other two, we're gonna assume that they're not ready to go and that's gonna knock the project down as far as ranking goes because we've ended up with a lot of projects that we thought were very good, but because the landowners weren't on board, all of a sudden the landowners are some of them intentionally, some of them unintentionally holding projects hostage saying, hey, we want the community to help us with this before we participate with that. We don't have enough time to not only go through the design permitting and implementation of the project and also have to deal with the land ownership. So if you've got a partner that's interested in participating with you, please write the and document the information in the project and consider adding a letter of support from that partner to um, show that they really are on board with it. Uh, show the connection between the project location and the area of flood relief. And this can be a connection that's from surface flow or from uh, storm sewer or pipe systems that gets there. Again, if you're not showing that if you put a project in at one location, you know, if it's five miles from another location, we're really not gonna see the benefit there that we need to. You're gonna, you're gonna be up against another project that the site might be within a thousand feet of where the flooding problem is. So um, plan on trying to provide photos or maps where flooding is occurring, give estimates of how often the flooding occurs, the, the size of the area, hopefully in acres or in square feet if it's a smaller area, and depth. So it helps us to understand you know, are we dealing with something that's 10 acres in size that's 18 inches deep, or are we dealing with something that's a tenth of an acre in size that's six feet deep? And we've had both of those things happen as well. Uh, Shovel-ready projects, they're only going to get higher priority if the project is a good one. Um, again, GEIGO applications with concept plans have received grant awards. The map that's there on the side is not saying where GIGO is going to get the highest priority. That's showing you areas of the state where rivers and streams have been impacted by stormwater runoff. So you can see if you zoom in on that, and I believe you'll be able to get this presentation um, from, the, from the organizers, you'll be able to zoom in and see that there's pretty much water quality impairment from stormwater runoff throughout the state of Illinois. Um, if you have multiple projects that you're cons considering submitting an application for, consider combining them into one application because the way we wrote the GIGO not notice of funding opportunity was that an entity could only get funding for a second project after all of the other applicants that had viable projects also got funding. Again, it was trying to help spread the wealth and not end up with all of the money going into one project there. Okay, so again, the, the applications are due by noon on November 20th of 24. The pro program is statewide. And again, it is to reduce localized river riverine flooding to protect Illinois rivers, streams, and lakes. The grant range is anywhere from 75,000 to two and a half million dollars. The two and a half million dollars is a hired firm. Somebody comes in with less than 75,000, we'll probably be able to make accommodations for it. but. 
we don't want to end up with $15,000 projects because it costs us as much to administer a $15,000 project as it does for a larger cost there. Maximum grant amount is $2.5 million. And again, we only have $5 million for the entire state. Um, minimum match requirement is 25%. Adding more match is not necessarily going to rank you higher in the process. But if you include things in your budget, whether it's for the reimbursement or as the match amount that aren't eligible items, you're definitely going to get dropped in the ranking system. So if you've got a permeable pavement parking lot, we don't want to see the costs for lighting for the parking lot, striping for the parking spaces, basically any questions of the items that you're putting into the budget ask how does this reduce or capture stormwater runoff? Well, lighting for a parking lot isn't going to capture that, so don't include it in the budget. If you have somebody that's saying, hey, you know, your manager's saying to you, hey, you absolutely have to include these other items in here, put them in there, but then identify that they're not being included as part of the budget. And when you're writing these applications out, um, treat us as application reviewers, like we absolutely are clueless. We are going to assume that you are not well-informed. So if you leave something out of the application, we're not going to assume that you're gonna do it. We're gonna assume that you aren't aware of it and end up not doing it. And then we end up with a project that isn't implementable. Uh, again, the eligible projects are green infrastructure, BMP implementation with limited design costs. The practices, again, can be a single BMP or a treatment train at a single site or watershed-wide projects that could be single BMPs located throughout or BMP treatment trains. The notice of funding opportunity, the link is there in the bottom of the slide. Again, ineligible costs, land acquisition, BMPs for new development. So if there isn't any work or any infrastructure, I'm sorry, per pervious non-pervious areas out there, and you're going to bring in a, a large building and you're wanting to do stormwater BMPs to reduce the stormwater runoff, it's not gonna be eligible. We're trying to deal with the problems that the state already has with stormwater runoff. Project administration, um, paperwork for invoices, quarterly reporting, those types of things are not eligible costs in the project. Routine operation and maintenance of the practices, education and outreach and monitoring, none of those are eligible for the program. Okay, so the, the GEIGO program and basically all of Illinois EPA's grant applications now go through the Grant Accountability and Transparency Act portal and are now going through the Amplifund system. So if you're not familiar with the system, you do need to get a little bit of time under your belt with this program so you understand how the process works, what all needs to be done. There's four pre-award pre requirements that need to happen, um, authentication, grantee registration, pre-qualification, and then assessments. Uh, you need to have a SAM.gov cage code number. You need to have a DUNS number in order to do this. So the system is now much more automated. Amplifund does let you, once you're registered in the system, to go into the system, fill some of the information out, go back out of the system, um, and then come back in and fill in more. So it, it's becoming a nicer system. And you should, as you're applying for different grant awards, whether it's DECIO, Illinois EPA, DNR, Department of Agriculture, um, the application process should be starting to become standardized here. Okay. okay, I'm going to skip over the majority of these, but for BMP implementation, be sure that you've got somebody helping you design the practice that knows something about stormwater runoff, a professional engineer or a partner like the Natural Resources Conservation Service are very good partners to have. They're going to help you think through not only how to put the practice in the best place, but also what's the operation and maintenance portions of it that you're gonna be required to do for the next 10 years, and maybe some tweaks to the project design to make sure that you can actually get in and do the operation and maintenance that's there. Uh, what to expect if you get funded. Um, we have a financial assistance agreement. We're expecting that uh, if I can get my work done in a timely manner, these contracts would start August 30th of 2025. They normally run two years in length. 
Uh, there's no work that you're gonna be asking for reimbursement or using as match that can occur prior to the contract or after the contract is over. So if you're partnering with another funding source to be bringing possible you know, state or federal match against the GEIGO program, make sure that that funding source overlaps with a start date of August of 2025. Um, let's see. There's design and engineering. The permits all need to happen. Again, 10-year operation and maintenance plan. We do have some forms that have to be filled out. There is quarterly reporting, invoicing, and final reporting that goes on. And again, reimbursement of eligible costs. Uh, the following slides are more examples of GEIGO type eligible projects. It just depends on who's applying and what they're applying for on how your project is going to rank out. Um, the two-stage ditch, in normal water levels, the water is going to be flowing at the lower level. When storm water comes in, the two-stage ditch is going to allow the storm water to flow out onto the floodplain. That's going to slow the water getting downstream in the area. It's going to increase the amount of infiltration. So it's really holding the water um, where the rain falls with a little bit of movement, but not as, not as much as if it was just a smaller stream. Bioswales, uh, a lot of times you'll see them right alongside roadside ditches in the middle of parking lots, um, but on larger um, uh, business compounds that have those. So again, it's, it's holding water for a certain amount of time. Now, the GEIGO program, again, we're trying to hold the stormwater in. So if you don't have a large area for stormwater retention, you might look at the design to see how to hold the water initially, but not necessarily hold it for a really long time so that as the water draws down, the capacity to hold future stormwater is going to be uh, available, available again. Uh, I have a family member in Sarasota that right now is saying, who knew two hurricanes could come within 10 days of each other? And, you know, so things like that, take that into consideration that we've got climate changes happening and we really do need to look at all of the practices to be able to do as much as they possibly can. Uh, permeable pavement street and parking lots, we've got practices or projects where they might do the parking stalls as the permeable pavement and the drive paths or the streets are done with a more traditional asphalt um, material, but under both the asphalt and the um, pavers, they've got um, an area for stormwater storage. So when you're looking at the footprint of your best management practice, take into account the whole storage area that you could possibly look at, not just necessarily the permeable pavers versus the asphalt that's there. We've got projects, tiny ones like wetlands that are there. Um, very quickly for the 2021 GEIGO applications, we had 11 successful applicants. Um, they might have been in the right place, the right time, the right price. They ranged from 83000 to just shy of $2.5 million. There were three porous pavement area projects. There was one project that was dealing with about 80 acres of wetland creation. We had two that were dealing with bioswales. Um, we had a retrofit to a dry basin into a wet basin, one two-stage ditch. Uh, retrofitting a parking lot with small detention basins, and we had a floodplain terrace that was reconnecting with the stream by a daylighting project, which basically means an area of the stream that had been forced into a pipe underground. They removed the soil above it, took out the pipe, and have turned it back into a, a stream. Um, unsuccessful applicants, we had 36 of that. Most of them, they missed the point of the GEIGO program. Again, those four topics that you have to have at the beginning. I struck through item number two. We had a number that didn't sign their app applications, but the new Amplifund system really helps take care of minimizing that. Uh, they didn't provide enough information or the correct information, so we could compare the projects there. Uh, they included eligible costs or had expensive taste. You know, we've got some neighborhoods where the only way the landowners are going to, homeowners around there are going to let the project go in is if you know, it looks absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. We're on a, a shoestring budget. So we're gonna be looking at, you know, can you do a rain garden for $30, you know, a square foot versus $120 a square foot. Um, 
they included the operation and maintenance as an afterthought instead of part of the project design. You can tell, you know, when people are th tossing things on on the end of the applications. And some of the projects just weren't ready. And I'm going to go to, um, this is the last slide on there, but if you look at the corner there on the lower left, there's some bonus slides that are talking about some different projects, what the funding source was, the type of work that was done, BMPs that are there. And so those are available, but I knew I was gonna talk over, so I'm, I'm just gonna stop. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. So we do have a couple minutes left, and so we're gonna just go and address some of the questions that were asked in the chat throughout the session. So, one of the first ones we have is for Roxanne. Um, could you give more information about maybe how much funding has been distributed over the past five years or just give an idea of like how much impact these brownfield programs have had? Yeah, I mean, I don't have those um, numbers in front of me, but I know that from state to state, um, you know, you have anywhere from two to four million that they are helping throughout the state programs. Um, the KSU TAB programs have um, multi-million dollar grants that are funded on a five-year basis to help out with technical assistance. And then the federal programs, <clears throat> I mean, I think it's between two and 300 million a year. I know the infrastructure bill um, was a $1.3 billion um bill that went through that was focused just that much was just specifically focused on brownfields in some capacity or another. So um, I know that they spend all of it every year that is allocated for. There's not um, ever any money left on the table, but how much specifically, I don't have that in front of me, but it's easily findable. I can always find that for someone if they want to send it to me. That's great, Roxanne. It's just good to know that there is a lot of funding out there. Um, if people are interested in these opportunities. Um, we have a couple quick questions for Christine. Um, could you clarify if green roofs are eligible and if GEIGO is going to reopen next spring? Okay. Green roofs are an eligible item. Um, I believe we funded them under IGIG in the past. And yes, there will be a notice of funding opportunity in the spring of 2025. And it looks like uh, Holly had a question regarding project administration. So project administration is not an eligible item. The only costs that can be captured under the GEIGO program are physically installing best management practices and a bit of design work. Now, you could have an entity that uses their own personnel to do the BMP work. So there could be personnel costs that are in there. So that is somewhat eligible, but again, it has to show up as planting plants, moving earth, something that is the actual BMP. And I, I didn't mention, but we do, for those that aren't in the GIGO, I'm sorry, in the GATA process yet, on our webpage, we do have a copy of the full notice of funding opportunity as a PDF version so you can go in and look at it and see the type of information that's needed in case you're still trying to get into the GATA portal and getting registered. You can at least do some of the work ahead of time. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. And then I have a question for Monica. You did kind of address who is eligible, um, but we had a question about um, private companies. I'm curious if you could elaborate more if a private company was a lead on one of these applications, how would the community involvement piece look like? Um, well, I would probably envision the private company being a solar developer, like a for-profit solar developer. Um, I think there are many ways in which they can actually be involved in a project even before it gets started, right from... Um, conceptualizing the idea when they um, are looking for sites, looking to see what communities are nearby um, and to start the engagement right then and there. But I know that's really hard from the community's perspective because usually communities don't even uh, sometimes not even get to know that a project is happening until they see like the first uh, you know stake of the PV solar <laughs> go in. 
But uh, just keeping ourselves informed, I think, helps a lot with that. Um, and um, having that engagement, if there's anybody in the state, local um, level uh, government that you could like send out um, emails or kind of be in touch with to see what projects are um, being planned, um, attend public meetings and things like that. I think that would be a good way for communities to get involved and also for uh, for-profit organizations and stakeholders to know that communities are willing to get involved and that there is money that's available. And the best part of the ERA is that um, you have to show a community benefit plan and uh, you have to show that whatever energy is being produced is going to the community. So without that link and without a good demonstration of how you're going to do that, um, you know, projects will not get funded. So I think community is at the center of all of this. But again, at the, there is a webinar, please do register. There is much more detail that's going to be shared in that um, later today evening. Thank you, Monica, really appreciate that. So I know that we are at time, so we will be wrapping up here soon, but if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to ask them now. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to our speakers for their time. We hope to see you on our next webinar, which will actually be next week on Tuesday at noon central time, so same time as today. And we will actually be talking about community benefit plans and agreements that Monica kind of gave us an intro to. So if you're interested in that, um, we hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you all.